Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's fun to be back on campus here at Waterloo where I spent a lot of time. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about, I picked a security topic uh, that's related to blockchain technology. I'm sure you've heard of blockchain. If you haven't heard of it, you'll know what it is by the end of this talk, hopefully. And uh, this is an issue that we raised quite a few years ago uh, because it was a problem that we kept encountering uh, and we wanted to raise awareness of it. And since then, it's actually become one of the dominant topics. Uh, so, so it's one of the most predominant topics uh, that, that is still being worked out uh, for blockchain technology. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, this particular area. So I'll acknowledge our, our uh, funding and partners. And the talk is structured around a paper uh, with uh, two of my PhD students, uh, Cheyenne and, and Massa. And uh, they, he, Cheyenne was at Consensus Diligence at the time, and uh, Massa works also at Offchain Labs. Okay, so you don't have to understand all the details of blockchain to understand what I'm going to present, uh, but I'm going to give you just a little bit of it, and then I'll tell you some stories, and then we'll think about what the stories have in common. So. Uh, Think of blockchain as a distributed set of nodes or networks or servers. Uh, these are computers that are going to run computation for you. So I have a method, I want it run. Uh, if I'm in a cloud kind of environment, the cloud service provider will find the nearest node to me. Uh, that node will run the computation for me uh, and tell me what the answer is, okay? The way blockchain works is a little bit different. Uh, what will happen is I'll broadcast the computation I want run to all the nodes in the network, or at least all the ones that I know about, uh, and then they'll continue to broadcast it and it will propagate around the whole network. And every node is gonna run my computation for me, okay? So there could be thousands of nodes, they're all going to run that computation. Um, they're going to check it uh, and they're gonna see whether it's correct or not, uh, essentially, so they're, um, let me uh, slow down and, and do it in slower motion. So the, it, it will get relayed around the network that I want this computation run. There will be a pool of all the transactions or computations that anyone wants run at a particular time. And so what the nodes are doing is they're pulling from the pool, they're running the transaction, they're seeing what the output is. And then one person will propose that, hey, when I run it, the output is Z. Uh, that's the answer I get. And then what they'll do is they'll take kind of, this is simplifying it, but think of it as taking a vote. So all the nodes will go into this voting process and they'll all vote and they'll all agree that yes, uh, when I run it too, I get Z as well. And if there's a consensus that Z is the correct output, then that gets kind of written down uh, in what's called a block. And, and so that's where this like term blockchain uh, comes from, okay? Now, as you can imagine, this is super expensive. Right? Every node has to compute every transaction. They have to do it all past transactions, even nodes that come in the future. To know that the current state is correct, they would have to re-execute my uh, transaction. But the trade-off for it is high integrity. So the chances that a Z gets written into the ledger that's wrong is, is very minimal, right? You would need a compromise of, of like a majority or, or a quorum of the network. So blockchain technology is really good when you prioritize integrity. If correctness and integrity is the most important concern for you, blockchain is good. Uh, if you want something that's fast or you want something that deals with big data, blockchain is terrible. It's, it's the worst, you know, the worst kind of database that you might use, okay? So financial data is something that we usually care about integrity and correctness, and we don't need massive efficiency, okay? There, there is a lot of transactions that happen, but the transactions are pretty small in terms of the amount of data they are. The kinds of computations like subtracting this dollar amount from your balance, they're kind of simple kinds of con computations, okay? So blockchain has found that like sort of Finance is sort of the, the, the uh, equilibria point that where it's found like the most uh, application. Okay, now there's one other aspect that goes into, I'm gonna give you specifically for Ethereum, which is the blockchain that we tend to use. It's, it's the, uh, the biggest blockchain that allows you to, to code general, uh, to ask it to do general things. The Bitcoin is the original. Bitcoin only allows you to do payments, essentially. Ethereum lets you do arbitrary computation. 
okay? And there's this like small detail called gas, and I'm gonna go through it because it's sort of relevant to uh, what, what I actually wanna talk about, okay? So as mentioned, uh, transactions will be bundled together in a batch, this is called a block. And so you're not voting on every transaction every time, it's more like here's a batch of transactions, this is the output for all of them, and then that's kind of what gets voted on. Now, you might say, well, what if someone asks, like, what if you ask the network to do an infinite loop, right? Now, all of these nodes are gonna be computing forever, it's gonna do a denial of service on the network and it's gonna be a big problem. So Ethereum's solution is we're gonna make you pay for your computation. Uh, if I look at a method, I can't figure out how much it's gonna end up costing. Uh, this is like a sort of decidability problem that's known to be hard uh, in computer science. So the only way to really r know like how long it's gonna to take to run is to actually run it. And so when I run it as a node, it's been compiled down to me in an assembly-like language. Uh, and so there's these opcodes, which are the atomic instructions. And every opcode has a gas cost. So gas is just a kind of made-up metric, uh, but, but we'll, we'll just call it gas. So like, if you do an addition, it might cost two gas. If you do a multiplication, well, that's a little harder than an addition, so we'll, that will cost four gas. If you want to verify a digital signature, that's a lot of multiplications and exponentiations in a finite field. That's going to cost you a thousand gas, okay? But whatever it is, uh, all these opcodes have a certain cost, okay? So what the node does is it starts running it, and it kind of turns the meter on, and then as it, uh, as it runs the computation, it's subtracting the gas amounts. Um, and when you ask for a transaction to be run, you just put a limit on how much gas you're willing to spend, and then it, it, if it reaches the end of it and it doesn't have enough gas to complete the computation, it reverts the transaction, uh, but it records the fact that it tried uh, to do it, okay? Now the final bit is, okay, how much is gas like in dollars? And the answer is that Ethereum actually leaves that open. So they don't, they don't say that, that gas has a certain dollar amount, okay? Uh, what they do is they allow the person that's asking for the computation to offer a certain amount of money per gas. So I might say, I'm willing to pay this much per gas. You might say, I'm willing to pay twice what Jeremy's paying, okay? And then what will happen is all the nodes, uh, they're not obliged to execute transactions in the order that they receive them, they can execute transactions in any arbitrary order. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take the transactions that are giving them the most gas, they'll execute them first, they keep it, uh, and then they'll go down the list and, and, and uh, start executing the transactions that are offered lower gas, okay? Now, as a human user, I don't really have to worry about this whole gas thing. My client kind of figures it out for me, okay? So a screen will pop up and it'll be like, this is the normal going rate for gas. If you wanna be sure that your transaction gets executed correctly, you could crank it up a bit. Here's a suggestion. And if you're penny pitching, and you, but you don't mind waiting an hour, right, then this is like kind of a minimal amount. You could, you could you know, save some money, but your transaction might not get executed right away. Okay, so the clients will sort of guide you uh, through that particular process. Okay, what's blockchain used for? So, uh, you have decentralized uh, finance is a big application. Uh, the, the term decentralized just means that it's not running on a single server, so it's running on this network of nodes. Um, and what Ethereum promises you is, let's say you have the Id an idea for like a new digital finance solution. As long as you can capture it in code, it can be fully automated, autonomous, then what you can do is you can push it to Ethereum. You'll pay some money to push it to Ethereum, but then Ethereum's going to run it forever. You could disappear, right? And Ethereum will keep running it, and if users want to interact with it, then Ethereum will, will do that for you. There's no limits in terms of how much money could flow through your, comp your contract. Um, and so, anyway, so, so it's, it's a little scary, uh, but it's also, you know, basically what's, what's happening on Ethereum now. And, uh, and so, anyway, so, so this area of, of uh, decentralized finance, there's a lot of firms and projects and people that are operating in it. Uh, there's a lot of money, digital money that flows through it. Uh, the total value locked currently is about 40 billion US. So in financial terms, that's not a big number, 
right? Like if you compare it to, I don't know, stocks or derivatives or, or other things in finance. Uh, but it's still a substantial amount. It's a material amount. Uh, it's something that we need to pay attention to and we need to study. Okay, so that's blockchain 101. Uh, now I'm just going to tell you some stories and then we'll, we'll think about what the stories have in common. So for time, I'm, I'm just going to tell you two. Okay, so the first story concerns something called ICOs, and this happened a while ago, like in, in 2017. Um, sorry, the slide got a little weird. Uh, okay, so an ICO is an initial coin offering. Uh, it's kind of the equivalent of an IPO, which was something that a company would do uh, when they start selling shares uh, publicly. And the idea was, it, was that if you had a project and you wanted to do your project on Ethereum, um, I'm just gonna, there's something weird going on in the slides, but I'll just, I'll keep it here. Uh, if you had an idea for a project, what you might wanna do is raise some capital. And so it became trendy to do this ICO thing where you would say, I have this idea for a service, I'm gonna build it, and when I build it, you're gonna need my custom token in order to use my service, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to auction off those tokens early in the project. You're going to be able to get them for a discount. And then later when I actually build the product and people are using it, these tokens are going to be worth a lot of money. And so you would have got in like early and so you, you know, it would have, um, you know, it would have taken on some value for you. Okay. So they would auction these things off. Now, there's so many projects that promised the moon and didn't deliver that now ICOs are, are met with a lot of skepticism. But at this time, there was like a new ICO every week and every, everyone was like super crazy about them. Okay, so what would happen in an ICO is you would have this auctioning off of the tokens and this would happen on chain. So it's happening on Ethereum in the blockchain. And if you wanna participate in the auction, you have to be like an Ethereum user, you have to know how the software works and things like that, okay? You have to be like really, you know, an expert uh, in order to buy them at auction. But we'll ha what will happen is in a couple hours or a couple days, the tokens, the people who buy them at auction, they'll move them onto a website where you can buy and sell. And if to use the website, anyone can use it. That's, that's aimed at normal users, right? You just have a username, you have an account. It looks like an exchange, like a stock exchange kind of thing, and you just buy and sell, okay? So what would happen is people would sit in the middle. Um, you might think of them as equivalent to like scalpers for like tickets for concerts or something like that. They'll go to auction, they'll try and buy as many as they can. And then when it moves on to the secondary markets, that's where the actual users are. There's more demand there, and so the thought is the price will increase, at least temporarily. So there'll be a little bit of a bump. They'll get out right away, they'll make their money, and then who knows what happens two, three days later uh, to the price. Okay, so this is a story of uh, an ICO called Status. And they wanted, they didn't like this like kind of scalper in the middle thing. Okay, so they wanted to do something about it. So they wanted to make a fairer uh, kind of ICO. They wanted to sell it to their actual customers. So they had two ideas about how to do this. So the first thing they said is, we're gonna put a cap on how many you can buy. Okay, you can't buy more than a certain amount. The details were kind of complicated. It was this sort of dynamically moving cap, but just forget about that. Just think of it as there's a cap. So you can't buy more than anything else. The second thing that scalpers would do is in order to get to the front of the line, this goes back to gas, they would offer crazy high gas prices, okay? Miners or nodes would look at those transactions and say, I'll make a lot of money, so I'm gonna bump those up to the front of the line. Uh, and so what Status also did is they said, we're gonna put a cap on how much gas you can offer. So if you offer over a certain amount of, of gas, then when the transaction gets processed, we're not gonna sell them to you at the end, okay? All right, so what happens is, uh, uh, so they raised about uh, 300,000 ETH. That's how much they auctioned off. This was $90 million uh, in US at the time. Uh, they were sold out in 16 hours. And the weird, the weird thing is because they had these rules, uh, there were a lot of people who tried to buy them that weren't able to buy them because they didn't know about the rules. So you might say, well, why didn't they know about the rules? Well, there's an ICO every week. So if I'm buying ICOs, I don't know that status is doing something special. I'm just using the script that I wrote 
for the ICO last week. I'm trying to buy them this week. Uh, I don't know about this dynamic price cap. I don't know about the gas price limit. So I'm still trying to buy them, you know, with things way above the, the caps and the limits, okay? So there were some transactions that went through. They were successful. They resulted in a successful sale. And then there were a whole bunch of failed transactions that went through. Uh, so they're still processed by Ethereum. They still process it, but it just doesn't result in a trade. And so uh, the ratio of successful to failed transactions was about 50-50. So you look at 100 transactions, about half of them were successful and half of them were failed. Now we can also look at these nodes on the network that are processing the transactions and voting on them and all of that type of stuff. Um, we can look at which ones were active, the most active during that time period, during that 16 hours uh, during this ICO. And so you'll see a list of them. These are called mining pools. The, the details don't really matter. Um, and then we can see how many transactions they process individually. And the red ones are uh, successful transactions and the blue ones are failed transactions. Okay, so you can see for each miner, uh, it's about 50-50 uh, in, terms, in terms of this. Okay, now this is where the story gets interesting. This chart is actually a lie. So there's one number that I fudged, all right? So I want you to look at, uh, there's one called F2 pool. It's the second uh, to the end. And you'll see uh, if the real data looks like this, okay? So it seems to me that there's some data that's missing. If they look like all the other mining pools, that box would be filled in, but it's not filled in, okay? So there's a whole bunch of successful transactions uh, that, that, that are not, for some reason, they're, they're, they're just not being processed uh, by F2 pool. Okay, so what we did is we sort of dug in uh, to, to what was happening here. And what we realized is that F2 pool and the members of the pool were active participants in the ICO. So they were trying to buy it for themselves. They were trying to buy tokens. And essentially what they were doing is they were allowing their own transactions uh, that were buying pools on behalf of themselves, they were letting those through. So they were putting them into the blocks. The unsuccessful transactions, they're not competing with their attempts to purchase. Right? These are things that are going to fail. And one reason that they're failing is because people are giving really high gas prices. And so these are actually very lucrative transactions. So they, they didn't censor any, you know, any transaction that would end up being unsuccessful uh, because there's no reason to. They'll just make money on it. It's not going to compete with them. But what's missing here are all the people that are trying to buy, tra trying to buy these tokens that are not F2 pool themselves. Okay, so essentially what they're trying to do is displace all of those orders by just not including them or uh, by censoring them. Okay. Then we also look to see, you know, for the 277, the, the little number there, like how, how do we know that that was F2 pool buying it? And so one thing about blockchain is it's, it has this reputation of being anonymous, but it's not exactly. All transactions are kind of like linkable to all other transactions. You just don't necessarily have identities for everyone. But you can sort of see that they took a pile of money, they split it up into a whole bunch of small accounts where the small accounts were under that limit and then they were buying it from all of those small accounts. So that's, uh, so, so basically you could kind of backtrace it uh, to, to F2 pool itself, okay? So that's the basis for our assertion that they were censoring these transactions. Can I be 100% sure? No, but this, this looks, like, uh, it looks like the story of, of what was happening behind the scenes. Okay, now I'll tell you a completely different story. Okay, so this is the story of a really fun website. Uh, it's a game, uh, it's called FOMO 3D. Um, and if you, if you go to the website, uh, you know, there's lots of flashing lights and colors and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the game, it, at the end of the day, it's just a game. It's kind of like playing lottery or something like that. Uh, but it's a game that kind of works well on blockchain. One thing on blockchain is you don't have random numbers that, or it's hard because everything's sort of deterministic. So a lot of games rely on randomness. So you have to try and think of a game that doesn't rely on, on randomness. So the idea of FOMO 3D is, um, there's this timer, and it starts at, whatever, three minutes, 12 o'clock time, and it counts down. 
and you can buy a ticket, and if you buy a ticket, then the clock will, you'll add time onto the end of the clock, okay? Uh, it costs money to buy a ticket, and the money that you spend on the ticket goes into a pot, okay? So I buy a ticket, I add time to the timer, the money I spent goes into the pot. And then other people do it, and the pot's getting bigger and bigger. And the idea is that if the timer ever hits zero, the last person that bought a ticket gets the whole pot. Okay? So it grows over time, and the theory is that it will never go to zero because you know, someone you know, will spend a dollar just to increase the timer, just to have that chance to be uh, kind of like the last person. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, and, and so that was the theory. Uh, in reality, it did go to zero once, okay? And that's this story. So I'm going to tell you the story of the, the one time that this uh, timer actually went to zero and someone won the pot. Okay, so this was in 2018, and uh, uh, you have Ethereum, so that's one smart contract that's, that's running, or sorry, FOMO 3D is one contract that's running on Ethereum. And so the adversary, we'll call him Walter, he deploys a bunch of other contracts, and these contracts don't do anything useful, they just waste gas. They just loop forever or whatever, not forever, but like to, up to the gas limit, and then they just return, and they don't do anything useful. Okay, so he puts all of these uh, contracts uh, up on Ethereum. Then what he does is he starts watching FOMO 3D and he's waiting to see like when the timer is going to get close to zero. So he's, it's never going to go exactly to zero, but he'll wait till it gets uh, sort of close. And so at one point it gets down to three minutes and he says, okay, this is, this is my time to act. Uh, so he buys a ticket. So he calls the function on FOMO 3D uh, and he now has a ticket the ticket adds a bit of time to the clock, so now there's, I, I forget exactly, but like three minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, so what he does is he knows that other people are going to start buying tickets, right? As, as the clock ticks down, someone else is going to try and buy a ticket, and then his ticket's no longer going to be the last ticket, okay? So he spams his other contracts, which are the gas-burning contracts, okay? And he pays, remember, miners will prioritize transactions that pay a lot in gas. So what he does is he looks at the going gas rate and he says, I'm going to pay like maybe 10 times what the going gas rate is and I'm going to ask uh, the blockchain to just run these computations. So, uh, so he does this and it's really funny because like most blocks have a thousand transactions in them. Okay, but this is ex an example of a block that was in that three minute window and you can see there's three transactions. All of them are from him. Uh, all of them are, have like a super high gas rate that's like 10 times like what would be normal and they're all consuming like an enormous amount of gas and you can only put so many transactions into a block once the total gas of the entire block exceeds a certain limit then you have to stop putting transactions in. Okay, so in other words, he was able to fill the block up with just his own transactions. All the other people that were trying to buy tickets, they're, they're trying to buy them, those transactions are going out, but the miners just aren't including them because they keep getting these, these better transactions to put in the block. Okay, now eventually someone like realizes what's happening, and so they try to buy a ticket, and they offer an extremely high amount of gas. So, so instead of, Walter was asked, was offering 500 gas, and 500 was probably, like, it might be like normally like five or something like that, so 500 is already an enormous amount. This person comes along and they're like, we'll give you 5,000, and so the miners are like, great, uh, we're, we're putting you right at the top of the block, uh, but the problem with this person is that they were just a second too late, okay? So this was the block where the, the uh, timer hit zero, and so they tried to buy the ticket, uh, the timer had already hit zero, and actually the process of them buying the ticket caused the code sort of ironically to send the money to Walter, who just won the pot. Uh, and so, yeah. Oh yeah, and then an another thing that, that was kind of cool about this is uh, Walter, remember he had these like big expensive contracts that were consuming gas. He actually coded them up to pay attention to what was happening on FOMO 3D, and the contract would first check FOMO 3D and it would say, uh, did, did he win yet or not? And if the answer is no, then they would run as, as long as they could, 
and consume as much gas. But as soon as they checked and FOMO 3D said he won, then they would just return right away. So Walter didn't have to like stop, like stop like trying to consume gas. He just programmed that into the contracts themselves. And so he, he continued to try and run these really expensive contracts, but they saw that Walter had already won and they were smart enough to, to, to know that. And so then they just, uh, just returned. And so it ended up uh, consuming a minimal amount of gas instead of 4 million, it was like 37,000. Okay, now you might say, okay, give me the goods. How much money did he win, right? Uh, and so the answer was uh, 10,000 ETH, uh, which was about $3 million. Uh, so that's what he won in order uh, to do this attack. Okay, so what do these stories have in common, these two stories? Uh, both of them are sort of premised on this idea that you're allowed to see transactions before they're actually executed, okay? So there's this pool of pending transactions and everyone can see what everyone else is trying to do and then you can decide, hey, I wanna sneak a transaction in ahead of a transaction that someone else is about to run. I have a mechanism to do it, I'll just pay more in gas and then the miner's going to prioritize my transaction instead. So in other words, there's a way to, in financial terms, we call it front running. So you can front run any transaction uh, because all the transactions are visible before they're actually uh, finalized. So this is now the term that's, that's used a lot is called MEV. Uh, MEV stands for minor extractable value. Uh, because we don't use miners anymore, uh, Sometimes people say maximal extracted value. But anyways, this whole MEV thing, if you, if you look at Ethereum now, it's like 25% it's like, like of all conversations about Ethereum have to do with MEV. And like, how are we going to fix it? Or are we just going to embrace it? There's sort of like different political positions. Like some people say, oh, MEV is fine. And some people say it's evil. And uh, it's, it's become this big thing. Okay, so the, all the stories are examples of, of front running or MEV. Um, what we did in the paper is we, we tried to oppose a taxonomy. So we said they're, they're not all exactly the same attack, but they all have this like kind of flavor. Um, so the three main types are there's a displacement attack. So a displacement attack is I want to run my transaction before yours, okay? But after I run mine, I don't care what happens to yours. Like if yours disappears, that's fine. It, it doesn't matter. Just me getting them there first is the most important thing. So like an example would be if you try to register a kind of domain name, they, they have the equivalent on Ethereum, and I see your domain name and I see that you're trying to register and I think I'd like that domain name, it's a cool name, then I'll try and jump ahead of you, I'll grab it, and then I don't care, like you can try and register it, but it already belongs to me, so I, I don't care about that, okay? Um, this is held in contrast to, I see your transaction, I still wanna run first, but then I really want your transaction to run immediately after me, okay? So for example, let's say you're doing a buy order of some tokens and I wanna be the person that sells to you. Then I'm gonna front run you with a sell order uh, and then I want your buy order to run next so that, that I'm the one that, that sells to you, okay? Uh, so that's the difference between displacement and insertion. And then the third kind is suppression where I just don't want your transaction to run for a certain amount of time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna front run you with a bunch of transactions that consume time, and I'm just trying to sort of delay or censor your transaction for a certain period of time. So if there's like an auction and the auction has a closing date, uh, if I can push your bid past the closing time uh, of the auction, then, then I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so the status ICO um, is an example of a displacement in our, our, our taxonomy, and then the FOMO 3D game uh, would be an example of a suppression attack. And what we did is uh, we uh, looked at the top 25 things that are running on Ethereum. We sort of categorized them, um, and we found the most popular things that people were doing at the time were some sort of financial stuff like exchanges, uh, there's these NFTs you may, might have heard of, so back then they were um, called crypto collectibles. Uh, there was a bunch of games and gambling and, and then there was this Ethereum name service. And so um, we found that basically all of these had some sort of front running issue, okay? Not, I'm not saying there was a vulnerability in the contract, but the contract 
would be vulnerable if you just implemented it in a naive way. So some of them try to deal with it in different ways, so I'll get to what the solutions are to it. But front running was a problem for, for all of them that they had to think about, okay? And so this is where we started to feel that this front running thing, it's not just like some attack that's in the corner, it's a corner case that applies to some dApps, uh, but it actually is a pretty prevalent thing that, uh, that is, is, is quite widespread across all sorts of different things that you might want to do on Ethereum. It's also, it kind of breaks your mental model as a developer because you, if you think about cloud computing, it's just sort of like I ask the transaction, it gets run. You're not thinking about the fact that everyone can see the transaction before and people can jump in line. So sometimes when you develop dApps, you're, you just don't have the mental model of like what's actually happening under the hood to know that this is a problem that you're going to have to address. So the way that people uh, mitigate it uh, fall into kind of four categories. I'm not going to go into the details of them, I'm just going to give you the sort of high level overview. Um, so you can try and sequence transactions, you can use some confidentiality, you can design around it, or you could just embrace it. Okay, so transaction sequencing uh, is this idea that uh, instead of letting uh, nodes on the network just you know, pick the one that gives them the highest gas and put that transaction first. You try and impose some order, you have some rules for how transactions should be ordered, okay? Now, a simple rule that makes a lot of sense would be what we call first in, first out, FIFO, right? So first transaction that was broadcast is the first one that goes into the block, so they go in the same order. The problem is we we're talking about a decentralized network. So if I send my transaction at a period of time, all the nodes that are close to me are going to hear about mine. You may send your transaction after I sent mine, but there's some nodes that are closer to you than are to me, and so they're actually going to hear about your transaction before mine, okay? So there's no global first in, first out uh, that, that's possible. Now, what people have done, researchers have done, is they've looked at could we add it to the consensus. So when everyone's voting on whether transactions are valid, they could also vote on which transaction did I hear about first. It doesn't mean you heard about it, but we'll all vote on what we saw first. And the idea is that if a majority of nodes saw transaction A before transaction B, then transaction A should be sequenced uh, before transaction B. Now, it's a technical challenge just to write down that rule. I said it like in very simple terms, but when you go through the formality and the formalism of, of formalizing exactly what it means, that in and of itself is a challenge. And then trying to get an efficient consensus mechanism that's going to do this for you is also a challenge. Uh, no one has one, like there's, sorry, there, in academic papers, there's these protocols, but in practice, no one's using these protocols yet. You could also have a third party that does it. So Chainlink is a company that's, that's talked about doing this. Um, there's these things called sequencers. Uh, and so they'll just, they'll, they'll kind of do it instead of doing it across all the nodes at the network. Uh, another thing you could do is just randomize the order. So there's a sort of fringe fork of Bitcoin uh, called Bitcoin Cash ABC, and they just randomly order transactions. That doesn't completely solve front running because you can kind of spray the transactions into it and hope that they just randomly end up in front of the transaction uh, that you want run, but, but anyways. Okay, the next theme, sort of theme of, of, of solutions is uh, you can front run because you can see the transaction, so if you can't see them, then you can't front run them. So why don't we just encrypt transactions or something like that uh, and, and try and deal with it. So we're gonna apply some confidentiality to it and then that's going to uh, do something about, uh, about front running. Now this also is complicated when you get into the details. It's easy to just say, oh, we'll encrypt everything. Well, what is everything? Like what exactly are you encrypting? Are you encrypting the name of the function that's being called? Are you encrypting the parameters? Are you encrypting the contract itself? What address? You know, you can't, deal with a smart contract if you don't identify which smart contract you want to deal with, right? So there's, there's only so much that you can sort of protect. And then even like, like say Bill Gates, you know, you see that he's interacting with a stock exchange. Uh, you don't know what he's doing. Is he buying, is he selling? What's the price? All that stuff is all hidden, right? But you're like, you know, he has a lot of Microsoft stock. What are the chances that he's selling them, right? I see a lot of activity all of a sudden. Right? And so that can just leak a little bit of information. You say, oh, I'll just buy some derivatives just in case, 
Uh, if he's selling them, the price is going to go down. I'll make some money. And if he's not, then the price will just sort of be stable anyway. So I'm not going to buy or I'm not going to make or lose money. So it's just it's sort of safe uh, kind of thing to do. So just knowing that somebody is interacting with something and you can see that activity, that could be like some signals uh, that, that would cause you to, to try and front run. So in the paper, you can read more details, but for the crypto people in the, in the room, uh, the sort of paradigms are you can do kind of a commit reveal uh, where you hide all the information, they're sequenced, and then after they're sequenced, everyone says, okay, this is what my transaction is. So sort of like you put it in an envelope, you, you put them in order, and then everyone opens their envelope. The problem is the person might not come around to open their envelope. Um, so then you say, well, could we force open the envelope? And so the answer is, yeah, if you had a decryption key, you could force open it. Uh, if you sort of did the secret sharing thing and enough people came together, you could force open it. Uh, you can use these uh, verifiable delay functions uh, that, that you can do as expensive computation and force it open, but it would take an hour or a day or something like that to, to, to force it open. These things tend to, to, to protect uh, what the function is and what the parameters are, but nothing else. Then you could also look at like SGX and trusted execution environments and uh, you could try and have the contract running on it but it's still writing uh, the state uh, to the blockchain. So this has been explored as well. That gives you a kind of higher level of confidentiality. Um, and then there's things like Zcash that you might have heard of and they're really just about anonymity. So they're considered a privacy coin but they're, they're really about hiding who's doing what but they're not hiding what's actually being done. Um, so ideally, like, it's a completely open problem to do like one, two, three, four, five, six. Like no one, no one has a solution uh, to that. Another thing you can do is try and design around MEV. Um, so for example, one thing that we've done some research like this where uh, we looked at uh, exchanges. So if you're doing exchanges uh, with tokens, normally what you do is you'd run what's called an order book. So a bunch of buys and asks go in and they get executed in terms of when they were received. What you can do instead is you can hold an auction and so people put their bids in, uh, but you hold all the bids for a certain period of time and then when the auction closes, then you execute all the orders and it doesn't actually matter what order they came in. Okay, so all the bids are, they're just evaluated on the price. They're not evaluated at all on uh, what time they were received. So real stock markets like the New York Stock Exchange uses this uh, to determine the closing or opening price of stocks and then it switches over to a continuous time order book. So that's an example anyway. So we have a whole paper about it. There's another thing around this ERC20 token that you can check out if you're interested. The last thing you could do is you could try to just embrace it. So there is, uh, there's people that believe that you can never get rid of MEV. It's just fundamental to the design of blockchain. And so what we'll do instead is we'll try to make it fairer. Uh, so what does fairer mean? Well, not all the money will go to the miners or to certain parties. We'll try and split it up um, and uh, things like that. So this, uh, just forget about that slide for a sec. Uh, um, Basically what will happen is the creation, the, the creation of these front running opportunities will become a kind of industry. So there'll be certain parties and what they'll do is they'll look through all the transactions and they'll find where front running is possible. Then they'll propose, oh, here's a block that would maximize the amount of front running and other people are doing it at the same time. And then there's a party called a relayer and they sort of, they, they take a couple proposals and they say, okay, this is the one that maximizes the most. And then they'll give it to the node that's going to produce the block and say, you can use this block or not, but if you use it, you're going to make a lot more money than probably what you could find uh, by yourself, but you have to pay us to use it kind of thing. And then the, some of that money will go back to the person that, that spent all the time looking for these uh, MEV opportunities. So it sort of spreads the wealth around. It also leads to specialization where different people are doing, uh, they have a certain subtask uh, that, they're, that they're involved in. Um, so anyway, so Flashbots and, and MEV Boost, and these are the names of, of some of these projects that if you follow the Ethereum space that, that would fall under this uh, sort of category. Okay, so to just wrap up, um, front running is still pervasive uh, in Ethereum. Uh, it's not gone away. We wrote this in 2017. Uh, it's still just as big of an issue, I would say, if not bigger. Um, 
we did it to increase awareness of the attacks, but now it's taken on a life of its own. Um, and so anyway, so if you're, if you're a researcher or a student, uh, this, is, this is definitely an area that deserves further attention. Uh, there's startups, there's even one in Waterloo that involves some, some people at, at, uh, at, in uh, the computer science here called Fair, Fairblock, I think. And so anyways, they're, they're, they have one solution that's based on uh, sort of encryption to solving this problem. But uh, it, it's not clear which of the four like main methods is going to win the day at the end of the day.